All right, it's time to begin. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for participating in the C uh, CJS webinar today. I am Keiko Yamanaka, lecturer at the Ethnic Studies UC Berkeley. Uh, today, uh, Professor uh, Junko Habu, director of the CJS, is not available. So I am going to serve as the moderator of the whole event. But before I introduce the speakers, I would like to make a statement that acknowledges UC Berkeley's, uh, or uh, excuse me, UC Berkeley's is, uh, Ohlone land occupation. Let me, yeah. So today I am speaking from the campus of the University of California, Berkeley, before starting this event, I would like to announce that I recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Fuchun, the ancestral and unseen land of the Chocano speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the uh, Mawaka Ma Oroni tribe and other familial descendants of Velona Band. I recognize that the Berkeley's uh, community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. Now, let me turn to the immigrant migration workshop series that CJS started in February last year in 2022. It is intended to bring uh, some of the uh, key concerns and the challenges that Japan faces regarding immigration to the attention of the CJS audience. Today's event is the fifth of such series and will address very timely subject that Japan's low and uh, mid-skilled immigrant workers, including technical interns, specified skilled workers, and international students. The next workshop, which is scheduled in October in the fall semester, um, will discuss, uh, this is also another very timely subject, reproductive health and rights of immigrant women in Japan. Please stay in tune. Now, let me turn to our subject for the day. Uh, the speakers of the day and a discussant for their lecture, uh, lectures. It is my great pleasure to introduce the two distinguished scholars from the Waseda University to hold the seminar entitled uh, Japan's Immigration Policy Conundrum. Technical interns, specified skills, and international students. Professor Glenn Roberts and Norika Fujita are cultural anthropologists and have written widely, as you know, you know well, on Japan's immigration issues. And another distinguished scholar, Professor Gracia Liu Fowler, is a sociologist who has also studied uh, Japan's immigration issues, especially regarding Chinese immigrants. In this seminar, each speaker or group will talk for 20 minutes. Professor Roberts and Fujita uh, give a talk titled, Is Short Term for the Long Run? Is Skilled Really Skilled? Japan's Convoluted Short-Term Labor Migration Schemes. Then Professor Liu Fala will address her talk, The Student Workers four decades of international student migration in Japan. Their presentations will be followed by the comments from another distinguished scholar and a political scientist from City University of New York, Professor Michael Sharp. 
Uh, after this, the floor will be open for questions from the audience. When you have questions, please write in the Q&A session uh, menu below the screen. Now it's turn uh, to you, time to you, Glenda and Norika, would you like to start? Okay. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Noriko Fujita, and we are very honored to present our study research today, which Professor Roberts and I had carried out for four years since 2018. And as an anthropologist, we have a lot to tell, so let's begin. Okay, in Asia, Migration schemes came to the fore in the 1970s. Japan is a bit latecomer, but by now, such schemes are indispensable to the provision of unskilled labor for industry as well as agriculture. Yet up until recently, the Japanese government has not opened such paths. So ethnic migration, largely of Nikkei Brazilians, began in 1990 and did have a long-term residency visa with possible access to permanent residency. Other foreign migrants have been accepted only through side doors as temporary workers under the guise of trainees, interns on the Technical Intern Training Program, TITP, for nearly three decades. The TITP started in 1993 as a one-year training scheme on, the top of, on top of a one-year foreign trainee visa program, which had been already installed in 1990. The total length of stay extended to three years from 1997 in sectors where the labor demand was really serious. From 2010, TITP was covered by the labor standards law, and their wages were also increased up to minimum wage. In 2017, the government passed Gino Jishu Ho to make the whole management system more rigorous and less open to exploitation. TITP 3 for the fourth and fifth years was introduced. Job mobility, job content, and ranks of residency are limited. Meanwhile, in agriculture in 2017, the Foreigners for Agriculture Support was introduced in four regions, Aichi, Kyoto, and Okinawa prefectures, and Niigata City, which had been labeled as National Strategic Special Zones, Tokku. In this three-year dispatch program, these foreigners were described as agriculture supporters. The system was widened to the scope of the jobs to include shipping and display and sales of products at their owner's farmer's mm -hmm. market. Former TITP2 graduates could join this program. By 2021, most of the supporters had either ended their duty and left Japan or remained as SSW. SSW, specified skilled worker, was introduced in December 2018, when the Abe administration passed another revision of the ICRA. It allowed foreigners in 14 sectors to enter Japan to work in semi-skilled labor. This is a genuine front door short-term labor scheme. For the first time, the government used the term worker, expecting them to be rapid deployment forces, sokusenryoku. They qualify for the status either by taking tests of basic knowledge and skills for industry and Japanese language skills, N4, <clears throat> or by being TITP graduates. <clears throat> In agriculture, the majority, 73%, came up from the TITP route. Their wages are stipulated to be at least slightly higher than those of TITP minimum wage. Although their visa is still tied to one employer, it is possible for them to change jobs employers within the same field or by testing if the skill level is deemed to be in common. SSW2, another new category now only applies to construction and shipbuilding industries, allows workers to apply for permanent residency. In December 2022, there are about three 125,000 TITP workers and 131,000 SSW workers in Japan. In both schemes, 54% to 60% of foreigners are Vietnamese, followed by Indonesians and Filipinos. So 
It is obvious that Japan's current migration program is taking one more step to opening the front door for low-skilled foreign workers to live long-term, eight to 10 years at most, at longest, if not allowing access to permanent residency or citizenship. It is here where the desirability of such a scheme can be questioned. We chose to investigate agriculture, where the both TITP and SSW schemes were operating. Agriculture is rapidly losing its mainstay workforce, the family farmer, due to the aging of the society and lack of successors. The Ministry of Agriculture, Forest and Fisheries report in the latest white paper that the total food self-sufficiency ratio and the total number of farmers have dropped over the decade. While the number of young farmers who are under 49 years and consist of 11% of the farmers, all farmers, have only increased little for the past five years. Even though some young farmers, young people from urban areas have entered the industry in recent years, they are not sufficiently produ productive to make a dent in, their, in this loss. The average age of farmers is about 67 years old. Digital transformation in farming is only beginning and weekly promoted, mostly among younger farmers. Moreover, global security concerns such as the Ukraine war, the COVID pandemic, and extreme weather conditions wreak havoc on agricultural supply chains, leading to soaring prices for agriculture's imported inputs. Almost all the farmers we interviewed felt hopeless in the face of shrinking workforce. Some farmers told us that younger generation values more balance in work and life. The result was the growing numbers of abandoned farms and the aging faces of their rural neighbors. But they had to maintain their assets, land holding, which they have expanded in the last 20 to 30 years, relying on foreign labor. This paper set two central research questions. What meaning does this system carry? Excuse me. This system change carry in regards to Japan's opening up to low-skilled labor migration. What sort of labor migration do farmers envision and is this sustainable? We interviewed with about 40 stakeholders in Aichi, Kyoto, and Tokyo from December 8, 2018 to January 2022. They are management organizations for farming and construction, farmer employers, MAF officials, local government officials, and agricultural researchers. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we conducted Zoom interviews with some of our key informants as well. We chose Kyoto and Aichi as our field work sites, firstly because we, they were involved in the TOKU project of foreigners for agriculture support implemented since 2017. So field work in these two prefectures provides us with good insights for comparison. Second, despite the economic and geographical differences, stakeholders in both Kyoto and IG prefectures told us of many common experiences in their businesses and lives. They were doing small scale agriculture on small and sometimes disparate land holdings. Dairy farmers told us manufacturing milk in mainland Japan is not so lucrative in comparison to Hokkaido, but they insisted that local milk tastes superior. In everyday lives, they both had local shrine-related festivals and rituals that the village people needed to support through their participation over the generation. All of their family businesses were supposed, succeeded, succeeded by the eldest sons, and or daughters. They both invested redesigning their homes or building entirely new facilities to house TITP and SSW migrant workers on their farms. So in December, 2021, we interviewed two officials at the Ministry of Agriculture, Forest and Fishery. Not surprisingly, the officials envisioned the TITP system as perfectly wedded 
to the SSW program as the first step to training for becoming a worker with specified skill. They said, the visa status of TITP workers is under the jurisdiction of the labor standard law, so in that sense, they are workers. But according to the Gino Jishu Ho, there is a regulation that they are not to be utilized to fill the demand for labor, and the spirit of the law is, I don't know if it is appropriate to use the expression developing countries, but I think you understand that it is through on-the-job training that this program seeks to transfer Japanese skills to people in countries that are now developing. In contrast, SSW status is, as one math official put it, a straightforward work credential. The officials noted that they are making efforts to have the two systems operated in accordance with their different aims. Here arising two issues on the two schemes. Is skilled really skilled? Is short term for the long run? Former employers we interviewed, in fact, wondered what specified skills really means. A cut forever farmer noted that during the COVID pandemic, her firm had accepted one SSW who had finished TITP2 in Harbury Farm. Why the worker has supposed to pass the basic language exam and had worked only in Japan, worked already in Japan for three years? Her ability in Japanese was very low. Moreover, the flower farmer had to train this worker from the start in flower cultivation. An elderly fruit farmer who had hired TIGP workers for 15 years echoed the skilled question. As the old farmer employer, he counts on fully labor to do some unskilled work, while he cannot 100% count on his son who might want to go out with his friends or go to doctor's office. In IT, while pointing out disjunctures in this system, a vegetable flower farmer posed a question, is tatemae, that SSW labor is skilled labor, very necessary? Under the MLJ's special guidelines to deal with the labor shortage during the COVID pandemic, workers have been allowed to change industries altogether. Indeed, the farmer has recently hired one SSW who formerly was in the construction industry. Then he suggested a new name for TITP and SSW visas, special work visa. TITP workers are not trainees, but laborers in reality, he reasoned, why the SSW skill requires too high a level of Japanese language and agricultural knowledge. He asserted that if the potential worker's language and agricultural skills was high enough to pass the SSW test, they would probably rather choose other fields to work in, for example, service work, than agriculture, certainly not a dirty job. Moreover, under the current scheme, there are no formal promotion system or base up system in place according to years of service. When we inquired with farm employers about opportunities for SSW workers to be promoted, we met with surprise. The prospect had not occurred to them. Some farmers did agree that if workers had credentials such as driver's licenses, they could then use the farm equipment to drive on the public road. If the workers had writing skills and computer skills, they could note down the greenhouse settings and take daily logs. If the workers were able to manage other workers as a leader, that would be highly useful. The fact is, however, the farmers are not considering investing these skills trainings in supposed to be temporary migrant workers. In the end, there was little sense of skill up or skill itself among the farmer employers in regards to these workers. <laughs> okay, now we would like to turn to the question of length of stay. So is SSW not a temporary visa or is it a temporary visa or what is it exactly? So um, here we'd like to use Martin Roos who wrote The Price of Rights uh, Regulating International Labor Migration. And Roos points out 
um, that in temporary migration programs uh, globally, there are trade-offs between the openness to unskilled labor migration in the receiving country and the extent of rights given to migrants. Uh, he, so the more rights you give to migrants, probably the fewer migrants you will be planning to bring in. He notes that there's a lot of pragmatism around the question of restricting some rights uh, for temporary migrants and the kinds of rights that uh, countries often restrict are permanent residency, employer choice, job mobility, and family reunification. Those are some of the major ones. So if we take a look at what's going on with TITP and SSW, um, you could be a migrant worker could be in these two systems for up to 10 years and still be called uh, a short term migrant. So uh, is this <laughs> it doesn't sound uh, like a short period of time uh, to us. And we wondered uh, how the farmers that whom we uh, talked to considered this. Did they consider it too long or just right? Did, or would they like workers to stay on longer and perhaps go on to SSW2? Well, <clears throat> most of the people whom, with whom we spoke uh, didn't, didn't want workers to stay on long-term, okay? Why not? Uh, even at the farmers meeting, uh, which we attended in December, 2018 in Aichi, uh, talk fears of internal security were brought up. So they were pretty conservative, some of these farmers. And one uh, farmer said, if you think of all the problems, you end up saying it's better not to bring in immigrants. But in order to in order for Japan to keep growing, if we had no immigrants, we'd certainly not grow. So it, he's trying to think of both sides of this issue, one very pragmatic side, the other these kinds of fears of migrants coming into the community. <laughs> there was another migrant, I mean, sorry, another farmer at the same meeting who noted uh, the unsettling presence, possible unsettling president, presence of foreign residents. And um, <clears throat> it, he brought up the question, uh, well, this actually, we were quite surprised at this because back in the end of the 1980s, there was a whole lot of hullabaloo about uh, migrants congregating in parks, in public parks in Tokyo. This is at the end of the 80s. And people felt oh, very uncomfortable about it and felt they must be into some kind of crime. Well, this was brought up at this farmer's meeting in 2018. All these years later, I was, I was uh, very surprised <laughs> that they still remembered that um, <clears throat> and felt fear or, or felt some people in the community might fear this. One person wondered if long-term migrants would be willing to take their part in supporting village rituals or events, and she thought not. Um, okay, having said all this, there were a few migrant, a few, a few farmer employers with whom we talked who were very positive about keeping people on for the long term. Okay, but most of the people we with whom we discussed this issue uh, didn't see that as being desirable. Next slide, please. Okay, so what does skill mean in agriculture then? One farmer told us, taking everything into account, I wonder who is coming here for learning and transfer of skills. It must be very few, and he laughed. Okay. So it became clear to us that in agriculture, skill that farmers want means a facility at basic techniques for production of farm products learned through on-the-job training relatively quickly, okay? Most farmers are not interested in paying more for extra skills, although they might entertain the thought if some workers had driving and data inputting skills. Next slide, please. In the construction field, the notion of skill is quite different, however. So we didn't go, um, we didn't spend a lot of time talking to employers in construction, but I did talk to two employers and I know, I realize that it is quite different. So workers are being taught discrete skills necessary for their trades, and a skill up program is being introduced to ensure that workers can gain mobility in the profession if they desire it. <clears throat> and the employers with whom I talked 
were eager to have their workers learn these skills and move up in the system. One employer noted that many of his foreign employees wanted to stay on for SSW2 status, were eager to gain that status, which requires management skill, language facility, and particular manual skills. Unlike most of the farmers we talked with, <clears throat> the construction employers with whom I met were enthusiastic about having these workers stay for the long term, perhaps because the skills are more difficult to learn and it is more dangerous to have continual turnover, but also because their businesses were in the city where there's more anonymity, less likelihood of locals complaining about foreigners, and it's easier for foreigners themselves to have a life outside of work. Moreover, the construction business owners didn't sound as anxious um, about the costs of labor, but I think uh, actually we only interviewed two uh, people in construction, and I think that we need to interview a whole lot more people before we can really conclude that. <laughs> so next slide, please. Is short term really, is it for the long run? Well, we hope not. Why? Under current schemes, short term can drag on for up to 10 years without decent rights and a chance for social mobility. The current bricolage of systems thus could lead to precarious outcomes, especially for migrants. It's also questionable whether migrants would keep choosing Japan as a destination given the weak yen. Hence, the meaning of the change in systems, which we queried in the beginning of this talk, is that there is more of the same confusion and obfuscation in the schemes with the added problem that workers would be in precarity longer. So next slide, please. What could be the alternative? Well, first, uh, one could scrap the TITP with its pretense of skill transfer. Farmers want this, and actually now the Japanese government is uh, also has decided to, to scrap the TITP uh, in terms of its pretense of skill transfer. So if you saw the news yesterday, you understand that. Maybe we can talk about it a little bit later. Um, they're going to come out with a full report in the fall. But we, I, we heartily agree that this is a good idea. So there will be no more pretense um, that it is for skill transfer. <clears throat> All right, so we could start with a migrant worker visa and on the job training and add a skill up component with wage hikes based on service years and skills acquired. Uh, offer a systematic online Japanese language course with successful completion linked to pay gradations, for instance. Farmers might be reluctant about the wage hikes linked to seniority and defined skills, but perhaps they could be convinced. Or uh, we could also offer the possibility of SSW2 benefits to migrants after their fourth year of agricultural work for those who have succeeded in on-the-job training and language training. As labor becomes increasingly scarce, farmers may warm to this idea as long as there is sufficient financial and community support. So then we get to our conclusion toward the future. If SSW2 were to be successful in agriculture or in any other field, <laughs> the national government would need to step in to invest a great deal more than it currently provides. And this is why uh, one of the reasons why we're not saying right now, oh, you know, we should immediately allow all of these uh, workers who come in to have um, long-term stay possibilities and family reunification immediately uh, because we don't think it would work. Why not? Because right now the national government isn't putting in the systems uh, in, they're not putting systems in place uh, that would assist these people to, to have a, a good life here. Uh, you would need systematic language training, including for spouses. Uh, for housing, you would need to have public housing made available or empty house renovations, for instance. For children's public educational programs and teacher training, legal changes to ensure that all children attend school, these things uh, are would be very necessary if people stay on for SSW2. Also, uh, national funding for activities to bring newcomers and their Japanese neighbors together so that they can become accustomed to each other. And public education uh, would be needed, would need to be inclusive and appreciative of the diverse others who make up Japanese society. So uh, there's an awful lot to think about. And we are really looking forward to this report um, that the government is going to come up with in, um, in the fall. Uh, we thank you.
very much for your for your kind uh, listening. <laughs> uh okay thank you glenda uh very interesting and very timely uh with the uh, report that came out just yesterday uh, announcement from the japanese government now we'll move on to another important um category of students and workers uh so gracia please start okay um let me share the screen first Okay, um, can everybody see? Um, so I'm going to continue this um, discussion by moving to the student workers. And uh, as some of you know that I started my research from uh, by uh, studying Chinese uh, students in Japan. And, uh, and so now uh, the student population has changed a lot, but a lot of phenomena have uh, remained the same. So um, for those of you who are familiar with Japanese politics, you probably can recognize these uh, people. Uh, on the left-hand side, as uh, um, Prime Minister Nakasone uh, Yasuhiro. That, that was uh, him with uh, uh, Satcher and Reagan. In 1983, um, he initiated the plan to accept 100,000 foreign students by 2000, which means, you know, by 2000, the annual intake of uh, students or annual resident, uh, res uh, student, uh, people who have a resident status as students will be 100,000. And um, in the middle um, is uh, Prime Minister uh, Fukuda Yasuo. And uh, although his uh, tenure was uh, very short, he did initiate a very important policy, which was uh, um, to accept 300,000 students by 2020. On the right-hand side, you can recognize the current prime minister, uh, Kishida uh, Fumio. And uh, just last month, he initiated the, uh, he proposed a plan to accept 400,000 students annually by 2020, uh, 2033, which means, you know, by 2033 in Japan, you should see uh, over 400,000 international students staying. So we can see in this uh, four decades, uh, you know, the different prime ministers have initiated uh, plans to uh, recruit international students to bring them into Japan. And you can see corresponding to their initiatives, there is a huge um, increase of uh, international students from the very left end is uh, uh, 1983 is around 10,000 to the peak. Uh, in 2019, which is 312,000. Um, so it's uh, an increase of 30 times, even though after 2019, because of COVID, there is a sharp decline uh, of international students because they were not allowed to enter Japan. And so the, the population reduced, but still, Basically, uh, uh, Prime Minister Fukuda's plan to uh, take in 300,000 students was fulfilled by 2019. And uh, the reason uh, there is a blue line above the other two lines is because uh, that blue line uh, indicates the total number of student population, including those who are enrolled in higher institutional educations, uh, uh, higher education uh, institutions and language academies. And uh, that uh, after 2010, uh, the, these two categories, college students and language students were combined. Um, and with the increase of population of international students, you can also see the changing faces of foreign students over the four decades. This graph shows you the uh, international students who registered at Japanese language agent, uh, language academies. So uh, around 19, 93 on the, uh, the left, left end, uh, the number one is Chinese, and then you have Korean. So the Chinese Korean uh, dominate the uh, language academies, Japanese language academies, until about 2012. Um, um, because 2011 uh, was this uh, um, 
Eastern Japan, uh, East Japan uh, earthquake and the uh, and the uh, Fukushima nuclear uh, disasters. Um, many Chinese students and Korean students uh, returned, and also you know there was um, this concern, and they were not coming. And uh, and the language academies went to other countries to recruit students. I will come back to this point later. So you can see over the um, you know, almost uh, four decades here from 1984 to 2021. Um, after this uh, 2010, you know, you, 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 you no longer have this uh, uh, orange bar, which is a signal here, uh, that indicates here Chinese uh, uh, language students. So after, afterwards, it's just uh, uh, Chinese students and Nepal, uh, Vietnamese students and Nepali students in the maroon bar. You can see there's an increase, you know, here is a lot of Chinese students, and uh, after 2012, there's a sudden increase of Vietnamese students in uh, uh, Japanese in, in Japanese institutions. This is the annual new entries of uh, uh, students, so you can have a see a huge increase of Vietnamese and and uh, and uh, also Nepali students, particularly uh, Vietnamese students. And I mentioned that the turning point is 20, uh, you know, 12 is because uh, uh, the 2011's uh, uh, earthquake and uh, nuclear disasters. And you can see um, the capacities have always been much more than the number of students registered in these academies. So this is statistics provided by the Association of uh, uh, um, uh, association for uh, promoting Japanese language education, Nishinkyo. And so especially around, you know, at 2011, 2012, you know, there was sudden decrease of student population. In 2012, you know, you only have 30, less than 30,000 students while the capacity is uh, close to 80,000. So uh, language academies, you know, in order to to fill the, the vacancies and turn to Vietnam, actually, and Nepal as well. So uh, you can see the language academies initiatives play a very important role in this uh, picture, in the, ch in the changing uh, uh, population um, uh, composition of international students in Japan. However, despite the changing faces of uh, international students, um, the roles that international students have played have not changed much. Almost all international students, especially those at the language schools, work. And um, this is actually a, kind of a, a website I, I encountered several years ago, and the website still there, the picture is no longer there. And it says, you know, that we support uh, this is Kiko, you know, like international student support organization. We guarantee hundred percent alubaito, which is part-time work. So international students have played very important role in Japan's labor market. As you can see from this uh, Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare's uh, uh, graphs. Um, on the left hand, hand side is uh, 2019 October and the total uh, number of foreign workers reported by employers to Ministry of uh, um, Health, Labor and Welfare uh, was uh, uh, 1.6 million basically. And uh, among those uh, foreign workers, 22.5% on here, is the uh, so-called shikakugai katsudo, which is the permission to uh, to engage in activities, uh, uh, you know, uh, outside of the visa a designated visa act, uh, activities designated by your visa. Which means if you have a, a visa that say uh, dependent or a student, if you want to work, you have to get this uh, a permit. And in fact, the a uh, majority of um, um, the, you know, people with a special permit to to work uh, were students. So students constitute nearly twenty percent of uh, uh, foreign workers that registered in Japan. And uh, in twenty twenty two, you can see the number has uh, 
uh, reduced, uh, partly because you know, there are fewer international students who are allowed to enter Japan. And uh, but still, uh, international students the over overall population reduced by uh, uh, over seventy thousand, uh, but between twenty nineteen to twenty twenty two. But you know, uh, the people who are engaged in this sort of a work only reduced by 40,000. So um, international students were really heavily engaged in Japan's labor market as casual labor, because, um, you know, as I will show that they were allowed to work a certain hours. So the question, first of all, is that what shapes this sort of a foreign student worker identity? Um, I want to, first of all, <laughs> just, uh, you know, uh, pull you out of this immigration, Im immigrant uh, labor kind of uh, mindset. Students are a very important casual labor force anywhere. Like for those of you, uh, many, many of you probably have worked um, uh, as a casual uh, labor in restaurants or at the convenience stores uh, when you were in college and uh, high school. So students have always, you know, naturally being a casual labor force. However, the problem with Japan is there's a reduction of these people that's available. As you can see from this graph, um, Japan is having this demographic crisis, as we all know, and uh, the kind of so-called productive population between 15 and 64 uh, age group peaked in 1995 and, and reduced very, especially recent years, rapidly. And uh, by 2019, uh, it was less than 60% of total population. So there is this demographic crisis, and then so labor market demands, you know, uh, need a useful labor in the labor market needs useful labor. So, but Japan at the same time, as we all know, has uh, has avoided immigration and has uh, a resi resistance toward so-called tanjun lodoryoku and simple labor, unskilled or low-skilled labor, as uh, um, Glenda and Noriko have uh, already presented. Instead, they use uh, TITP and recently, uh, you know, specified skilled workers also as a skilled workers, right, S except for specified. So no simple casual labor. And um, at the same time, you know, uh, when Nakasone proposed this international student uh, plan, it was justified as uh, internalized, uh, internationalization, I'm sorry, kokusaika. So start, start from, starting from 1980s, and this internationalization has been a very uh, potent ideology in Japan and it has uh, legitimacy. Um, and uh, Fukuda's uh, um, uh, plan actually uh, proposes the slogan of global talents. So international students in, in a sense fit both um, ideologies they were brought in because they are force of internationalization, uh, both for Japan's uh, higher educational institution and also for Japan's uh, soft power. And, uh, and also there are potential you know, human resources, highly skilled human resources. So they considered uh, really desirable uh, people. And also they have a purpose, which is study, which is always a very, um, you know, sounds very good. And at the same time, Japan does have this legal permit to work. Um, till 1998 was 20 hours a week. And after 1998, they expanded to you know, 28 hours a week. And during school vacations, you can work up to 40 hours. I have to uh, emphasize that dependents uh, are not allowed to work beyond 28 hours, but students are. So, you know, you have these uh, um, the shortage of young people. And Japan's reluctance to bring in people, uh, you know, like kind of service and manual labor for a long time. And then you also have the ideology of uh, internationalization, global talents, which, uh, you know, promote international education uh, and international student mobility. And then you also have give these people uh, uh, opportunity to work. And there is also, you know, you just open a kind of... Uh, a really potent, a really convenient channel for a lot of people to come in to work. And also the threshold of, uh, you know, entering as a language student is very low. And before I had no requirements other than the say, high school uh, cred credential. Um, so you have this emergence of education migration industry that uh, 
you know, wants to take advantage of that. You know, the, the, the education migration industry includes, it's a visit transnational, including language schools, mostly Japanese language academies, but increasingly they also have a partner or they have the collaboration with language schools uh, in um, the sending countries. Uh, we visited uh, uh, quite a few of them in China as well in, in Vietnam and, uh, in what, at one school, when I was interviewing them, they, they will give these students some basic training because you need N5 and in order to get into language uh, schools in Japan. And when we were walking out, some, some other Japanese language school uh, coming in to talk to them, to, to, to try to bring the students to their school. And, uh, and also vocational schools, uh, as I will show, uh, Samon Gakko. Uh, or some, some people also call them special training schools, and also a very, very important vessel for uh, international students, especially from uh, those uh, graduating from language schools who, uh, who have not advanced into like universities. And uh, Samung Gakko vocational schools, uh, mostly private businesses for kind of trade trainings. Um, in Japan, because of the reduction of young people, Many of uh, those vocational schools rely on international schools to fill the spot. Some of uh, international uh, vocational schools, like uh, uh, when I was doing field work with one in vocational school, 90% of students were international. And also you have uh, brokers. Those uh, uh, from 1980s, at uh, uh, the very beginning, it was, uh, they, they were mostly uh, individuals, people who came as the language students and then they saw the opportunity. They were just a partner with some Japanese individuals and open up language schools and they can rent apartment, uh, like a two room apartment that can, they, they can go recruit 500 students, have three shifts. So, um, those brokers were, uh, and nowadays they're also uh, working, you know, to recruit uh, uh, students. And uh, sometimes uh, they work for language schools, uh, but increasingly that sort of a transnational education migration industry becomes syndicated. Um, as uh, this uh, example that we saw in, in Vietnam, um, those, uh, education consulting firms they also have their own and also in china as well they have their own language education then they have all those services for example from consulting to training to pre-departure um uh, kind of advice and providing uh, dorms and sending them to language schools. So each student will pay on average between 10,000 to 13,000 uh, American dollars for the whole process. I have to point out it's not an income that the, these people take, rather this amount includes language school uh, tuition and airplane ticket and, uh, and other service fees. So we can see actually these, uh, these uh, you know, this industry is, uh, I'm sorry, is, uh, is there. So with this kind of uh, uh, forces, um, um, international education has become uh, a, a side door for labor import. Um, and so the question is then for, is foreign workers, uh, foreign student workers a problem? And uh, in Japan, there has been this moral panic about fake students. You know, as this uh, a journalist, uh, Dei, uh, has written uh, several books actually about this uh, uh, immigration crisis and the Giso Ryugakuse, et cetera. They're like working as the slaves. So people always talk about, you know, international students' quality is low and the uh, fake students. And uh, early on, when I discussed these issues, I, I, I actually kind of talked about the productive side of this because study is a way for international students to learn about the society and uh, learn the language and the culture. However, there is this kind of uh, possibility for it to break down, you know, and it's overwork. It is a very, uh, is a very good possibility, a very big possibility, especially given that, uh, uh, many students probably owe a lot of debt to the whole migration industry. And, uh, and the other outcome that uh, people have been discussing is that uh, uh, with this, uh, uh, the, lang the inadequate language ed education and also by working too much, especially for um, Vietnamese and Nepali students or students who come from uh, a uh, non-Chinese background, you know, who don't have this linguistic affinity with uh, with Japanese, um, they do not advance 
to higher educational institutions. Rather, ma majority of them go to Semon Gakko, Senshi Gakko, the vocational schools, as this uh, graph has shown. Indeed, for Vietnamese, Nepalese, Mia, you know, Miamese, and people from Sri Lanka, Indonesia, you can see uh, here is the total number of the students graduate that year. This is the number of students who en entered a vocational school. So, especially among the Nepalese and Vietnamese, absolutely majority, like in 80 to 90 percent of students entered vocational school. And many people pointed out the vocational school is just another visa mill, right? It gives them extension, not adequate education, and, uh, and students have to work uh, in order to uh, stay in, in, the, in the vocational school. It's just the extension of part-time uh, job career. And there's also this uh, uh, um, you know, report about how vocational school, this is the, the van actually has the vocational school's uh, name on it and sending students at night to um, this uh, uh, lunchbox uh, factory. And then this is a six o'clock, they, uh, they went there to pick them up. So this is like the vocational school served as a labor broker uh, for their own students. And so this is all, you know, especially in Japanese media, there's a lot of a portray, portrayal of this kind of incidences. And I did as a actually, but I made a point of looking at the statistics of the kind of uh, uh, visa conversion between students and the, you know, work status. Um, so, this is uh, the 2021, the last bar is 2021. In fact, among the, the international graduates who managed to convert their visa status to say work-related visa, 41.6% of them are from vocational schools. And only 34.4% uh, were university graduates. So, so this, uh, you know, the four-year university graduates. This really shows that the big increase from, like, to, um, you know, 2016, you know, it's a, it was a, a lot of uh, vocational entrance. I think we also see increase of uh, vocational graduates entering Japanese uh, labor market. So this actually makes the situation maybe less um, um, kind of uh, grave in a sense, but it is something we can discuss. Uh, and, you know, but still, we can see the presence of a huge number of international students overstaying visa. In fact, in, in, in 1990s, a huge amount of Chinese students overstayed uh, a visa. That was, you know, the most, uh, uh, the highest percentage of visa overstayers among the Chinese were from students. So we still see this, uh, you know, uh, the kind of... Um, study work scenario when you work too much and you don't cannot renew your student visa and you 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 and or you can cannot advance to next level of education and you become visa over overstayers um, so right. the last slide is discussion okay. and I just very quickly first That's of all hard. I think we want to I, I kind of want to bring you to this revisit this educational channel international labor migration concept which is a concept I, I kind of uh, proposed in 2009 so first of all let's contextualize the side door I mean when, when for the Jap Japan migration scholars when you mention side door is always the very haha you know Japanese just government just wants to use those uh, side doors to bring in labor and uh, it's a negative, critical thing. I completely agree this stance, but at the same time, when you go to sending countries, <laughs> you do feel that this side door means a lot. Of the fact that they are allowed to work in Japan in order to study meant a lot, and it really uh, lowered the threshold for, for international student uh, migration. And uh, so it's, you, know, you have to contextualize this side door a little bit. And also the moral panic about so-called the gisou gakse, fake students. And what is the context of this panic? Why are they panicked about? And uh, first of all, I think people have this idealistic or even elitist co concept of edu international education and ed international stu students. They're like middle class, you know, like going cheerful, happy, studying and, and earnest students in, in college. But not all international students are like that. International education might not be just for those people. And the kind of uh, uh, you know, moral panic uh, you know, originated 
originated from this really general Japanese society's kind of, in a sense, xenophobia. It's kind of ethno-nationalist impulse to reject those people they feel undesirable, which foreigners who are working in the low, low skilled jobs. As actually uh, Glenda also mentioned a moment ago. So, and also, but, you know, this is what does a good thing become bad? You know, I, I, I thought work study could be a productive linkage. However, when you have a you know, profit-driven education migration industry stepping in, and they are necessary to a certain extent, but what's the boundary? How can you re regulate them? When does the gray become black? And I'm thinking what could be the policy solutions? First of all, I think we really need to reconsider or jettison, jettison the idea that international education is somehow some elitist uh, 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 practice or engagement. And it's very pluralized, especially in the current uh, world situation. And maybe Japanese government, maybe linking this to SSW, because currently some language schools are already advocating this uh, you know, SSW visa to their students, according to my uh, student, um, Anne, who is also in the, uh, in the audience. Maybe Japanese government should think you know, linking this, uh, uh, this language training, which actually, when I was in Indonesia, I noticed how difficult that was for the locals stay in Indonesia to learn the language. And so maybe you can you know, subsidize language learning and turn this into inter international education and the students are allowed to work. And at the same, at the same time going through language training at a subsidized the cost. And maybe we need to regulate, not maybe, you, we definitely need to regulate the education migration industry. And also maybe we can consider legitimize international education as a, a channel for regular manual and service workers instead of the instead of just highly skilled workers in white collar jobs so these are the thinkings i'm currently kind of uh, you know having in my head and i, I welcome discussion and uh, and the comments thank you very much Thank you, Gracia. Okay, Michael, it's your turn to comment on these two uh, presentations. Okay, I'm just trying to get the camera started here and it's not starting. Why is this happening? That's really weird. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, why is this not? Okay. All right. So uh, thanks very, very much uh, to, to Professor Yamanaka and to the two, um, the three for presenters for, for, uh, for uh, presenting. Let me see, start my video. Maybe that will work. Hmm. Hmm. Now it's coming on. Okay. Um, both pieces take on the problematic of, of low skilled labor, um, that, that is agriculture, uh, construction and students in the midst of demographic decline in Japan using uh, both similar and different me methodological um, approaches. Both are important scholarly uh, um, contributions with far recent far reaching policy implications for Japan and, and the world. The two presentations seem to center around the two, two arguments uh, for, for Roberts, Professor Roberts and and Fujita, um, that that is um, uh, uh, work work in, in precarity longer is a problem, and for uh, Professor uh, Lou Ferrer, it seems the argument is around uh, uh, contextualizing uh, um, international education as a side door for agency for the other side for for descending side. As a political scientist, let me take a moment to talk about, about liberal democracy and, and how it's an, it is important in the context of migration. Jim Holyfield, a political scientist, talks about the liberal paradox and the, and the paradox of economic openness and political and legal closure uh, that comes in liberalism to protect the social contract and the legitimacy of the state. Gary Freeman talks about the role of, of clientelistic politics and their capture of the state in liberal democracies, how liberal democracies tend to be more expansionist in immigration policy for that reason. Um, Yopka, sociologist, discusses self-limited sovereignty and how the moral and legal constraints of the liberal state make it, make it difficult to prevent unwanted immigration. So we know that 
uh, G Germany sounded a lot like Japan uh, did many, many years ago, but now it is admittedly a country of immigration. Joe Karens argues that rights accrue to non-citizens in liberal states as they did for Zainichi Koreans uh, in Japan. Um, Non-citizen non guest workers in 1980s Europe were able to advocate for more rights in those liberal states. So my question I, for everyone is, um, Japan is part of the liberal democratic order. So, and we see some of the, some of the same phenomena uh, in Japan. Um, in the long run, we'll, we'll be see non-citizens acquire more rights uh, in the context of, of, of liberal democracy. But now just to go on to some comments on the, on the two papers, um, and please answer these at will or don't answer them. I, th I thought for, uh, for uh, Professor Roberts and Fujita, uh, um, great, tour, great point about short term really being long term and the, the problematics of, of, a, of being in a precarious situation longer. Um, I, I wanted to know more about who are, are in, the, in one side you talk about core persons, um, I, and I wanted to hear more about that. Great research questions. I very much like the invocation of Martin Ruse um, and the, the trade-off uh, between openness and, and rights. Uh, this sounds very much like Japan, but it also sounds like, like every other uh, uh, liberal state. Uh, let's see. A very good point on the slide 11 is that the current system can drag on for 10 years without decent rights and change for social mobility. Okay, so let me go on to some um, questions. Uh, okay, how am I doing on time, okay? Yes, you are, yes. Okay, all right, so um, what, so I wanted to hear more about the kinds of questions you were asking your, um, the people being interviewed. We know about, and the rationale for the different places makes a lot, makes a lot of sense, very convincing. But what is the percentage of, of workers that are female? I wondered about that. Um, I, we know the, na the main point of, of TITP is supposed to be skills transfer uh, to a developing country. And we know that that is uh, problematic. Uh, besides cheap labor for Japan, what else was being achieved? We know we, that it's, it's going to be done with soon. Um, how has, the, how has this remedied the demographic crisis that, that um, if compromised? Hillary Holbrook has written about the social construction of skilled and of, of skilled and low skilled. And it seems that, that these on slide seven, the distinctions between skilled and unskilled workers seems a bit slim to me at, at best. Um, is this casualiza casualization of labor um, a reflection of neoliberal trends around the world. And, and when you talk about rights, could you elaborate more on what specific rights do, do foreigners have, foreign workers have um, in Japan? Um, what explains the, the capture of around limits to immigration in Japan? I know Mike Strauss has written a bit about this, but is it elite capture? Is it, is it public uh, opinion? Is um what what is it? Okay, um, let me go on. Um, for a great paper, for Professor Ferrer, um, the paper reveals a number of paradoxes around Japan's policies and and the realities of, of foreign students. Several Japanese governments have proposed to increase the number of, of foreign students, as as you point out. Paradoxically, the the number of foreign students in Japan seems to be going down, but the number of language schools is, is going up. And I know that's around COVID. Uh, you talk about the Vietnamese and Nepalese students having gone up, but, but Korean and Taiwanese students, there seems to be a, a decline from what, what you show in the, in the slide. Um, students, as you said, constitute some 20% of foreign workers in, in Japan. So here are some of my questions. One is about the methodology. How many people, or is this just statistically driven? Because it seems to you seem to allude to some interviews. So I wondered how many interviews, where, and in what what time period. Maybe that's in there, but I, I didn't catch it. Um, uh, in Glenda and Glenda Noriko's uh, 
paper of work, we heard a bit about rights, but what kinds of rights uh, do student workers acquire in, in Japan? Who is the group called other in slide four? You mentioned Asians, African, uh, well, you don't mean, uh, I'm wondering, is it other Asians, Latin Americans, Africans? You brought something out in your presentation about, about uh, groups not being prepared or not having the, the let's say, language uh, background to uh, end up in, in on the vocational track in, in Japan. So I wondered about the, the racialization of, of labor uh, in, in Japan. Does your phenotype um, make a difference in the treatment and the possibilities of, of integration? Uh, let's see, what else? I also thought when you on slide eight and slide 11, when you're talking about the shaping of the foreign workers identity and transnational migration industry, is this a, a, just a process of, of casualization of the labor force and youth, which happens all around the world, and possible feminization uh, in international education? I'd like to hear more about the role of women uh, in this, in these broader processes of neoliberalism and the casualization of the labor force. Uh, with regard to slide 18, I wondered, is there any place for asylum seekers and refugees in this? Is there any uh, crossover? Um, when uh, in both presentations, uh, they talk about, you all talk about policy solutions, which I think are very compelling, uh, pluralizing for in, in Rasia's um, uh, presentation, pluralizing international education, legitimizing international education for our, a channel for regular and manual service workers. Um, I thought also though, I think the Japanese public also needs um, in Glenda's paper they, and, and Enrico's paper, you talk about actually making it easier or more or easier for the different communities to coexist. So I think in, as part of this education, the broader Japanese public could, could be educated about its own minorities and see these students who come as possible future citizens. Real substantive multicultural education. In both instances, I was thinking more comparative research with, uh, with other countries, United States, Canada, Sweden, even South, South Korea. And a final measure might be, and maybe not final, to draft anti-racist racist legislation, which I know is on the books, but with penalties, okay? And in both cases, it, it seems that these are attempts to securitize my migration. For Rousey, I asked the same question. What explains the capture uh, of, of uh, mines to limit immigration in Japan, elite capture, public opinion, uh, bureaucracy? Both, um, both presentations are very compelling. And I, I will just end with a, quote from Gracia's most recent book. If, if quote, this is 2020, if, J if Japan can shed its monoethnic and monocultural national identity and reform the outmoded institutions that reinforce such an identity, it, would, it could even emerge as one of the most attractive destinations for migrants. Thank you very much. Look forward Thank to you. the discussion. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, Glenda and uh, uh, Noriko and uh, Gracia, you ha we have total of five minutes for you. Oh boy. You know, this is almost impossible. So you may just say a few words uh, to Michael's, yeah. Okay, uh, Michael, thank you for your comments. Um, they're very interesting. Um, I hope someday we can send you the whole paper. This was based on um, a, a paper that was much more extensive than the slides you just saw. Um, but uh, you asked in the long run, will we see people acquire, will we see these migrants acquire more rights? Already because the government has established SSW2 for construction and shipbuilding, uh, those SSW2 people will be able to acquire more rights, okay? They will, I mean, the fact that uh, the Japanese government has given these uh, people the possibility of um, 
long-term residency or a permanent residency if they apply for it after they've been here they, and, and family reunification. Um, that's a sign that things are gradually moving toward uh, more rights for so-called, I mean, you know, it's not unskilled labor, it's skilled labor, but <laughs> whatever you want to call it, more rights for foreign migrants who come here to work, put it that way, and who are not the elite, the cream of the crop. Um, maybe, I don't know, Noriko-san, do you have something to add here? Right. Um, thank you, Mike. And regarding the rights, Ruth wrote about it, and he categorized rights as five, as, so I would like to introduce this categorization. He raised first civil and political rights, economic rights, social rights, residency rights, and family rights to reunion. Right? So, so I think these are indicators to measuring migrant rights. And I think we, yeah, we would like to research more about what 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 which categories are can be can be applied to Japan's case and which categories can be applied to Japan's long-term case as well as short-term case. So mm -hmm. yeah, this is my answer. Okay. Uh, let's move to Gracia. Yeah, I would just very quickly. Uh, first of all, I think the international students, if they are hired as uh, part-time workers, they they enjoy the similar rights as uh, you know young uh, college students in Japan, J Japanese students will enjoy as a casual labor, and basically not much. <laughs> um, rights as a worker, but otherwise it's just they are a student. Um, and about gender uh, composition, in fact, uh, for a very long time, it's very even for the Koreans and Chinese, um, it was very uh, gender even. But after uh, 2012, especially among the Vietnamese and Nepali students, uh, more male than women. So uh, I think maybe it has to do with standing country cultures and you know, how they treat uh, you know the uh, uh, men and women differently, but in terms of composition, and currently more men than women, especially for uh, Vietnamese and Nepalese. And uh, about the racism, and there is this kind of tendency, especially, but it's it's a, less of a kind of a because in, in fact most of these people are still from East Asia. And but there is a kind of uh, some some kind of moral panic. I was just a, kind of, a little bit things about the Vietnamese students. A lot of report of their mm -hmm. uh, report on their the criminal activities and 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 there's a lot of uh, uh, publicity about that. And to the degree that the Japanese government is thinking, so which country actually is it one of the projects? Is which country has a much more like, desirable labor? <laughs> this wow. is a, I mean, I think this sort of <laughs> racial thinking is there, or it's not racial thinking, it's really kind of stereotypical cultural thinking that's attached to some sort of essentialistic view of, uh, you know, people. So, yeah, I think that's the kind of extent of uh, racism that I have observed in terms of methodology. Obviously, this is kind of 40, 40 years kind of overview, and it's my own reflection from my different periods of field work. I start from Chinese, where I, over, <laughs> I interviewed over 200 people. And and uh, then uh, Vietnamese was in mid the twenty tens, and uh, and also I draw on like excellent work from by say Depeche and Carrel and uh, other scholars. So I think this is a kind of overview. So I apologize for explaining my methodology. I'll stop here. Okay, right, thank, thank you. you. Okay, we are about to finish, but the uh, I would I'd like to ask Michael to talk. You know kind of give some concluding remarks of the seminar. Okay. All right. Well, well thanks very much. And so, sorry that my my camera um, went off, but somehow it, it came back on. Um, thank you very much for, for, for including me in all of this. Um, uh, in my uh, concluding remark, I would just say that I think that very often we study uh, Japan as, as an outlier. And what I would like to emphasize is that Japan has a lot in common with other countries. And, and, um, and I think sometimes the kind of um, putting Japan in that box of being so different, it, it, it actually precludes so solutions to, to problems. Because, it, and that's why in my remarks, I really encourage uh, comparative uh, research on, on this. 
But uh, thank you very, very much. And and I think we, I, I hope we all agree, but I'm very optimistic about Japan and about <laughs> and, and about its uh, immigration policy. Well, I think it will, uh, it will incrementally <laughs> change for the good. That's very nice conclusive remark. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, happy for the future. All right. Uh -oh. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Attending thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank for you the much. speakers. Thank, thank right. you. This thank is you, it. Okay. okay. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.